Okay, so um, the next speaker, um, Bob Turner, was mentioned yesterday by Denis as uh, somebody who'd been uh, pivotal and influential in the facilitation of being able to make uh, diffusion measurements. Bob um, was extremely disappointed that he couldn't be here, so we arranged for him to come over to Kubrick, and I conducted a little uh, sort of interview with him. Um, so I'd like to play that for you now. I don't stand with this silly expression on my face all the way through. Um, and so it's about 10 minutes, um, but I'd, uh, I'd really like to play it, so if I just dim the lights. Well, it's a pleasure to have Professor Bob Turner with us here today, um, who is obviously a key history maker in the field of diffusion MR. So Bob, thanks for coming here today. Um, perhaps you could start by just setting the scene for us. Uh, when was this and where were you for this particular moment? Well, this was right back in... 1984-85. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, I just moved to join Peter Mansfield's group at the University of Nottingham and um, at that time hardly anyone was doing echoplanar imaging in the whole world. In the first year that I was there I built my own 32 by 32 echoplanar scanner. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I came there because I was interested fundamentally in, in seeing if MRI could be used for studying brain function. So interesting looking in brain function, but how did you think you were going to measure it? At that time, I had uh, the idea that one could treat the flow of blood as uh, pseudo-diffusive in the capillaries and to use a diffusion weighting, weighted sequence to actually capture that blood flow, mm -hmm. okay. later known as IVIM. So, take us back to 1984. Was there anything on the horizon? Is there anything that you'd seen in the literature that was kind of, uh, you thought could be used to this extent? Well, it came along a little bit later, the work of uh, uh, David Taylor and Marie-Claire Bushell, who used the Stechtgal Tanner diffusion gradients to create an image of an egg. Okay, so I think uh, we have a uh, little excerpt of that paper here. And if we look in um, carefully, I think this is probably one of the very first images or ADC maps of an egg. I think it'd be fair to say this is the first single shell acquisition in diffusion imaging. <laughs> yes. Okay, so there's this image of an egg. What were your first thoughts when you saw this image and its relation to be able to image brain function in the living human brain? Well, my first thought was that eggs don't move right. and so it's a very easy target and you can average as long as you like and the images whatever imaging technique you're going to use there's going to be no problem mm -hmm. but this um, this image was formed using a multi-pulse technique which took some time and um, uh, it became clear to me very early on that um, when you add diffusion gradients, you sensitize the, the imaging tremendously to any kind of movement, not just diffusion. And so um, at that point, it became clear that the way to go was to use a single shot technique. Mm -hmm. And of course, I was at Nottingham, and the single shot technique around was echoplanar imaging. Okay, so you just mentioned about, um, I know one of the images you uh, wanted to look at was this result from 1990. This was from uh, Doran and Bidder's paper, and quite clearly you can see the artifacts there. So EPI was the solution. Just, just set the scene. I mean, how widespread was EPI at the time? How many people were doing it? Um, what were the technical challenges? Well, at the time that I proposed the first sequence for diffusion-weighted echoplanar, there were only about three sites in the world, two of which were in Nottingham. There was my, my scanner and there was Peter Mansfield's scanner. Mm -hmm. And then over in Massachusetts, there was uh, Rosetzian and Pikett's echoplanar scanner. And that was it. Okay, and so you kindly um, brought along uh, the first presentation of the diffusion-weighted sequence, uh, diffusion-weighted EPI from 1986. Uh, where was this presented? That was presented at a NATO summer institute on cerebral blood flow held in Italy, in L'Aquila, uh, where I met the great uh, Lou Sokoloff, and, uh, among other people, mm -hmm. and really learned a huge amount about blood flow. But 
I had the great opportunity of presenting this sequence um, uh, a, as a non-invasive MRI method for actually also getting at blood flow. So this, this sequence, I think we've got a little zoom in here, that was in uh, 1986, but if I remember we were speaking earlier, you'd presented the sequence but hadn't actually been able to implement it. So no. it was a, a challenge to implementation. So could you talk us through how you go from a, what's effectively a sketch on paper to practical implementation? In Nottingham, we were still working at 0.5 Tesla at the best of times, um, and that was just before I left. And the gradient strength was, was high, but not really high enough to give the kind of diffusion weighting that one needed. And the agenda in Nottingham was cardiac and not uh, brain. Right. So it was only when I moved to NIH in, I think, April of 1988 that suddenly it think many things became possible. So you arrive at NIH, uh, yeah. determined to do EPI. What was the next step? What was needed? To get a commercial scanner to perform EPI so that I had all of the... Um, nice presentation, uh, visual presentations and so forth. But to, to do that, I had to build my own gradient coil to get the gradient strength and, this, and the switching time, the fast switching time that was needed. So the first diffusion weighted EPI gradient coil was like what? What was its characteristics? It was a head only um, single axis coil, which uh, was quite light in construction, very robust and produced um, about 40 millitesla per meter with 100 amps of current. Okay. It was just big enough to fit somebody's head in. And I think this is a picture of this. So this is your construction. So you've got the hardware ready, but obviously it's going to need some collaboration with others. So who were your key collaborators and uh, how did you then go about getting this interfaced into a commercial scanner? At this point, I really should mention Danilo Bihan. He arrived at NIH a few months before I did. and. As soon as we both realized that we were at the same institution, we started to collaborate. And so he was a lot of the inspiration of what we were doing, but he didn't know anything about EPI. Okay. But the other um, really useful collaborators were James McFall, who had been working at GE. Now, at NIH, we had a GE scanner. James McFall had um, um, backroom access to GE engineers at Walkershaw, who had been interested in doing echoplanar imaging. So he put me in touch with them, and uh, with, also with the great help of Maury Blumenfeld, who was manager at, at GE at that time, um, the, a lot of paths were made smooth, and I was able to take my little gradient coil in a suitcase to Waukesha several times and interface it with the Cigna, GE Cigna scanner and we were starting to get really quite nice diffusion weighted images. So uh, let's have a look at those uh, images. Just talk us through, I mean, uh, there was already a hint at something important about the diffusion phenomenon uh, that we could see in vivo here. Um, yes. That perhaps we couldn't see in the egg of Taylor and Bushell. The differential between white matter and gray matter, that one is quite striking. It was already apparent in these images, even with a diffusion gradient only in one direction, that um, there was anisotropy in the white matter. As you can see in the bottom row of slides where the diffusion gradient is strongest, this goes up to about a B factor of a thousand. You can see that the pathways, the um, uh, superior, inferior pathways stand out more as darker. They experience the effect of diffusion gradients more than the uh, lateral pathways, the transverse pathways. Sure. So um, that's already a, a good sign because it took the work of um, Mike Mosley in San Francisco to really um, grasp this fully, uh, working in cat brain. Right. And mm -hmm. he, we really should consider him the, the first person to thoroughly un investigate the anisotropy of white matter. This was uh, in one particular participant. Um, I know you were then keen, not necessarily uh, didn't set out to map anisotropy per se, you just wanted something that was reproducible. Um, and I think one of the next slides um, 
shows the efficacy of your approach. Uh, again, would you just like to talk us through the, uh, what we're looking at here? These are two separate subjects, but um, where the, uh, the points are measured from a region of interest taken in the amygdala, which is a, fortunately a fairly uniform, chunky part of grey matter. So one can see that the points from the two different subjects basically lie on top of each other. Uh, and these data were collected around 1990. We're now really talking 27 years ago. Right. It was the first EPI images, but the rest really is history. I mean, yes, it's, it's yeah. become, without doubt, probably the mainstay of diffusion imaging. Um, but knowing what you know now and about developments on the field, um, what do you think the future is for EPI in diffusion imaging? Will it be superseded or is there more to explore? I think that... Um, recent work using multiband. Um, this is work by such people as uh, Kevin Setsenpop and, uh, and my former student um, Cornelius Eichner, so that you can collect the data much faster, and it's sort of three times or five times faster. That gives sure. you the opportunity of exploring a much larger range of, um, of B factor and uh, a wider uh, directionality of the B factor also. Um, and uh, then um, Cornelius Eichner's introduction with his colleagues at uh, MGH of real diffusion imaging in which you actually just look at the real part of the signal rather than the magnitude part, that actually solves a major problem in diffusion imaging. And I really look forward to seeing further developments on that, uh, on that front as well. And then finally, because it, it's become very clear that very high resolution is vital for tracking fibers uh, as they approach the gray matter, mm -hmm. um, the use of segmented EPI techniques, um, which are highly efficient, um, but with perspective motion correction to make sure that the that you don't get the distributed motion artifact, which of course is the reason for using a coplanar in, in the first right. place, the distributed motion artifact. Mm -hmm. So if you, um, if you can nullify that by using very precise um, uh, perspective motion correction, then you can go down to, I know that we'll get down to resolutions of half a millimeter or better. Sure. And that's going to be very exciting to see those images in vivo. Yeah, we look forward to seeing yeah, them. Yeah. So Bob, I know that there's some people you want to thank, and we have a, a final slide here um, as your key collaborators. Yes, um, well obviously number one is Denis Le Bihan, and um, Jim Picard was uh, very involved in a lot of this early work. Uh, Kyle Hedges and uh, Scott Chesnick were very much involved. I should also thank uh, Crit Monan for okay. a lot of support at the uh, in vivo and MR centre at NIH. And um, I have to thank people at GE Medical Systems, that's Bob Vavrick and Joe Meyer, who were terrific partners in, the, in actually getting the sequences put together. Also their, their boss, uh, Mari Blumenfeld, who is a man of, well, great vision. Okay, so Bob, now it's my turn to say thank you. Thank you very much for coming in to record this video today. Um, it's always a pleasure to hear you speak, and it's a real shame we couldn't have you at the conference, but I know you have a conflicting commitment to go to Brussels uh, to evaluate grants. But thank you for speaking, but also thank you for your contribution to the field. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Um, um, it's uh, it, it, very disappointing for me that I can't be in two places at once. It's just not yet technologically possible. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs>